Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Peter Marty, Senior Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. The world we live in can be a tortuous and brutal place, where human dignity gets trampled upon in a regular way, and coldness of heart can sometimes seem to reign supreme. It's not the whole picture of our lives, thankfully, far from it, in fact. But when we hear in the Christmas story of King Herod slaughtering some innocent children, yes, that's actually in the Christmas story, we should not be all that surprised. In fact, the existence of that brutal act may be its own reminder that we should always seek 
to find a way to make sure that when we speak of joy or when we experience joy, we should never ignore the reality of suffering. And when we suffer, we should always remember that joy is there in the shadows, never completely absent. I'm going to read today that painful story of Herod's killing of little children, a sort of revenge killing, it would seem, for his fear of Jesus displacing him. But as you hear this little story and the message that follows, I also hope you will not forget part of your Christian calling, that is, to spot goodness in the world and to create as much kindness as you possibly can, even if it seems, oh, such a small kindness on some days. So here now the reading from the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning at the 13th verse. After the Magi had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because those children are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in another dream to Joseph, this time in Egypt, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are now dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth. Well, now take a listen at the start of this brand new year, 2023. Take a listen to what it is that Christ might have in mind for you this year. Well, the last time we were together in this place, or some of you were here, the crowds were larger. I'll say that. The cattle were lowing. The sheep were abiding their flocks by night. The angels were hovering. And uh, the little Lord Jesus, well, he was asleep on the hay. A week has passed, though, and most of the world has moved on from Christmas. You may have noticed. Uh, it's just kind of the way it goes. But I hope you ate well. I hope you did not have your pipes freeze on Christmas Eve. I hope you dealt with that difficult relative who doesn't cooperate all the time. I hope you had long phone conversations with whoever you had to talk with. It's all part of uh, the joy of the season. If you have a Christmas tree, like the kind that you pull out of the soil rather than out of a box, you're probably vacuuming these days. This is pine needle cleanup time. And I don't care how well you vacuum, Come August, you're going to find some pine needles. There's thieves that come into your house and they plant them there and they put them around. It's the revenge of the pine needles. There are two birth stories in the New Testament, uh, Matthew and Luke. We always read Luke on Christmas Eve. It's the, it's the tender story. It's the swaddling cloths. It's uh, the angels singing the word Gloria, stretching it out 20 syllables long like we do in church. Um, it's tender. And so in a real sense, I think we could call Luke the G-rated version of the birth story, and we might call Matthew the R-rated version because there's more violence and 
the Matthew account. Uh, today we have Matthew. And we only have it because there's some group of people someplace in time that sort of assign these readings to the church. I'm serious. So that churches around the world are in sync, you know. So on your Happy New Year's Day, you have this marvelous story, if you missed it. Uh, there's no sanitation of Christmas here. Uh, Matthew tells the story of Herod's henchmen slaughtering kids in and around Bethlehem. Uh, presumably males, boys in particular, under the age of two. We don't have any other historical reference to this act of cruelty or evil. It's mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. It's mentioned nowhere else in early Christian history, literature type places. Um, but let's assume it happened. And if it did, in fact, Bethlehem, which was quite small, it might have meant no more than a dozen or maybe two dozen kids actually getting killed, which wouldn't necessarily uh, create a lot of notice for a lot of people. It's not hard to picture it occurring, given who this Herod is, and perhaps if you know anything about the New Testament or the Gospels, you've heard of him. He had a reputation for malicious violence. He murdered his own wife, which takes some doing. He killed two of his sons, uh, and in Caesar Augustus' words, he purportedly said, Caesar did, maybe in jest, quote, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son, which says a lot about Herod, who was um, sick, paranoid, and a very insecure ruler. So it's easy to villainize him, I'll grant you that. He plays the role really well. He, um, well, when plan A failed to try to find the Christ child because these wise men led him, led him astray and he couldn't find the Christ child, he flips to plan B, which is basically this revenge killing stuff. Seeing that Mary and Joseph have taken off for Egypt, he goes after the innocent children in and around Bethlehem. I do think, and stay with me here, but I do think Herod may be the one figure in the Christmas story who really understands Christmas. He's vicious, yes, he's clever, he's paranoid, he's got these neurotic tendencies and anxieties, we know this, but we should give him this much credit. Unlike everybody else in the Christmas story, who oohs and who ahs and who sings these marvelous glorias, he seems to really know what's going on. The future is intruding in on his world. The world as he understands it is collapsing around him. Everything that Herod has taken as comfort is suddenly under threat. Everything that he values is now in jeopardy. So it's like the future's rolling in on him uh, with a, like, like a wave that, that doesn't quit. And if Jesus is Lord, well, guess what? That means that Herod is not Lord. And Herod's infected with what we might call a kind of self-centeredness. He's not comfortable with a universe that has someone other than him at the center. So yes, the future's coming at him and it's taking him over. And you know, to this extent, I think we might actually have a little bit of Herod in each of us. Because if Jesus is truly king, then what we thought was our little zones of personal sovereignty, they're over. And they're not sovereign. The fact that Mary and Joseph had to flee the wrath of this guy, I think, is a reminder that we all take suffering very seriously, even in the Christmas season, or maybe especially in the Christmas season. Suffering is not merely other people's problems. It invades each of our lives. And frankly, its presence in this world, I think, is one of the reasons we come back to this place over and over again to retrieve, to recover, to know hope that's so thickly woven into the Christian 
faith. After Matthew references the Herod's killing spree, he goes back a thousand years in time. He pulls out of the prophet Jeremiah the story of Rachel, who lost her children. And he quotes Jeremiah in this Rachel, weeping for her children, unable to be consoled because the kids are dead. Now, I don't know, I've thought about this, but I'm not sure, so I'll just say, I don't know if it's possible to measure the severities of grief. Could you possibly measure any differences of grief? But if there is any scale, I want to put the grief of a mother or father who has lost their child unexpectedly or prematurely, I want to put that way up there. That is as bad as it gets in my book. And you just have to watch some news clips like Post Uvalde where you've got parents that are weeping. My baby, my baby's gone. And you can only watch so much of it. The funerals that I've done in my ministry for kids, those are the toughest things I've ever done. And it tears me up because what you see stripped from these families is a future. I'll never forget in Kansas City, the church I served, I did a funeral for a family of four. They were just wiped out in a horrific car crash. And so there in the front of the church where they barely fit, four caskets, mom and dad on the outside and the two little caskets in between them. And I would have done anything I could to be excused from that funeral. So yeah, the, the, the suffering of kids the world over, it's so painful. It is so hurtful. But it's not bad to remember at Christmas. And not just because Herod brings it to mind, you know, but because you know as well as I do that in this world of our human experience that, that joy and suffering, they're commingled. They are. That you can't separate them some days. And I think if, you know, if you've never heard the... Uh, the marvelous poem of Ina Hughes. I commend it to you. Google it. Put it on your refrigerator for a while. She prays for kids of all types. And we also ought to pray, in her words, for children who put chocolate fingers everywhere and who like to be tickled and who stomp in puddles and ruin their new pants and who sneak popsicles before supper. And she says, you know, we, we need to pray for children who bring us sticky kisses and who sleep with their dog and who cover themselves with band-aids and who sing off-key and who slurp their soup. But we should also not forget to pray for those children who never get dessert, who watch their parents watch them die, who can't find any bread to steal, who don't have a room to clean up, whose pictures are not on anybody's dresser. And she says, we need to pray for those whose nightmares come in the daytime, who will eat anything, who have never seen a dentist, who aren't spoiled by anybody, and who go to bed hungry, crying themselves to sleep. As we take stock of, you know, these hard realities in our world that just slam us, what I want for myself and what I want for you is some response other than the one that all of us are apt to give at one point in time, which goes something like, I feel so lucky that I live here and not there. I feel so fortunate and so grateful that I have the circumstances and the blessings that I have. Because to feel something more than just gratitude for not being caught in the condition that other people might be in, this is part of the Christian calling. It just is. Yeah, gratitude's a part of faith. I, I understand this, but you know, solidarity or some willingness to share in some piece of some suffering of somebody who's hurting. That might be the best Christmas gift we could give, you know, to this world that we live in. I know this is hard. I know certain things are really hard to watch or to listen to. Especially when we feel powerless. It just, you just want to keep a distance. But we have to try. We have to try in some small ways. You know, I don't know if it's calling on people or if it's 
voting on some city initiative or serving in this capacity or feeding people who are hungry or advocating for the well-being of others or maybe it has to do with letting little situations or, or certain causes just stop you in your tracks or something that might cause us to pay attention to people that we just look right past, right over their heads. The future's coming at us, as in 2023. <laughs> and it will intrude on your life, and it will intrude on mine. You may wonder what will happen to you this year, or to our nation. No one is ever fully prepared for the future. And the unknown can make us nervous. The future came at Mary, remember, and it took her adolescence away quickly. All these things beyond her control, beyond her say. The future hit Joseph like a ton of bricks. First with an angel telling him, you better get prepared to change some diapers. And then later on an angel telling him, you better get out of Dodge because Herod's after you. And as I mentioned earlier, the future certainly intruded on Herod, which stripped him of the world that he thought he had under his thumb. Well, the future's coming at us, too. The next 365 days. Some unknowns, some unpredictables, surely some unwanted. We've got to figure out a way in our celebrations, in our joy, in our sunshines of faith, to try to do something in our power to share any piece of our lives with somebody else or a whole lot of somebody else's who are suffering. But one last thing. I want all of us to uh, try our best in the next 365 days to see the fundamental goodness in other people. When we know that evil, you know, draws the headlines... And, and wickedness catches our eye. But wouldn't it be marvelous to notice more goodness? And I have a story to help you remember this. 30 years ago, this guy from Nevada named Fred Turner was 53 years old. He was vacationing in Beaufort, South Carolina. And his 14-year-old Ford pickup truck died on the side of the road. So he's under the hood. He's working on the alternator. And some gentleman walks past sees the Nevada license plates, and says, it looks like you're going to have a long walk home. But he went on to find some help, brought the help back to the guy in the pickup truck, and he was on his way. Well, Mr. Fred Turner decided then and there he was going to walk across America, walk across America, coast to coast, and discover all of the goodness, in spite of all of the evil and all of the suffering. So he did just that. He set off walking, and he was only eight days, I think, into the walk when a pickup truck pulled up next to him. Two guys got out of the pickup truck, and they said, are you the one who's walking to discover goodness? It was in the news. He said, yeah. They said, give me your wallet. So they took his wallet, and they pushed him over the edge of the bridge. He fell 80 feet into the Savannah River. He, he wasn't killed, though he got damaged and his eyes were blackened and he lost a shoe and but he floated to this island and a fisherman picked him up the next day and he decided he needed to regroup and reset but he's still going to take the walk and that's what he did he walked the back roads of America till he got to San Diego County and each and every step of the way he had people sign his little book you know and he made his whole diary of all these goodnesses that he encountered it was pretty extraordinary. What he discovered was that good always outweighs evil. It always has more beauty, more merit, more presence. You just have to notice it. So this is what I want you to do and, and, and me to do for the next 365 days. Try your best to spot, to notice all of the goodness you can. And along the walks that you make, probably not coast to coast, but every place you go, try to create some goodness too. Try to create some kindness too. And a year from now, 
let's compare notes. And let's see where we come out. Happy New Year. Amen. Join me in prayer, if you would, as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Oh, the future will be coming at all of us this year without our permission. So receive this day with the faith that Christ has planted in you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord's face, shine upon your face and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and thanks for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to projects that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way, you feel a part of that reach. Tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.